I'm Lynn Manuel Miranda, and you're listening to Hard Knock Life. Welcome to Hard Knock Life. I'm Keith Chow. I'm Brittany Monet. I am Dominic Ma. Happy Juneteenth. Happy post Father's Day. Mm-hmm. Eventful weekend. Happy championship to the Golden State Warriors, Dominic. Dubs up. <laughs> we also have a lot of Disney Plus stuff to talk about. So we're going to just dive into it. Episode five of Obi Wan Kenobi, yeah. the penultimate, and episode two of ms marvel it's crazy that they're like just overlapping these you know for the for so much of this podcast we like focus on moon knight or Mm -hmm. wandavision or you know like one thing at a time the mandalorian boba fett but now we have to have we just wednesdays are very busy here at hard knock life headquarters so which which show did you dive into first on wednesday kenobi it is a penultimate we're only gonna have one more to talk about anyway so let's Let's talk about it. This is the one where Obi-Wan's on the planet Jabim. They're about to evacuate. But remember, they were being tracked by by Nerds of Color writer Lauren Lola. Shout out. I know Lauren listens. (laughs) She had a bug implanted to make her evil and shut down the, I guess, the escape hatch Mm -hmm. to allow the Inquisitors or at at least allow Reva and Vader to show up. And we get the big reveal that we've all hinted at for for a long time. But before any of that, before any of the plot, Brittany Monet, I heard you scream all the way on the other <laughs> side of the country when it cold opens on Coruscant. And yeah. de-aged or not, Hayden Christensen was standing right there on the balcony of the Jedi Temple. What was what was your actual reaction when when you saw that little Padawan braid? Star Wars is giving me what I want. Yeah, I was my only critique of you know episode four was there wasn't enough Hayden Christensen, and you know I think that they just mentally knew that they had to make up for it in episode five because there was so much. It was it was amazing. I was happy. So. <laughs> Were you surprised that they went all the way back to Attack of the Clones? Because yes, you and I that... had been saying perhaps Clone Wars stuff where where they're kind yeah. of both in their prime, but this was like this was pre Attack of the Clones because he still has his hand. There's like 19 year old um, Anakin there, right? Yeah. And I didn't mind that they didn't use de aging technology because whatever, just, I don't know, it's not that big of a deal to me. Like, mm-hmm. and then a lot of people were saying, like, maybe they purposely didn't use it because in Anakin views himself as older and wiser and stronger. So, like, that's also why maybe, like, they didn't use it because it's Anakin's point of view of, like, mm-hmm. you know, that memory. But no, I thought it was great. And he looked good. He still looks good to me. So, <laughs> Dominic, as someone who had been trailing off on Obi Wan Kenobi, did Episode Five bring you back at all, or are you still? Is it still in your rearview mirror at this? Oh point? no, it was, it was all right. I mean, this one, like, I appreciate that Obi Wan kind of had his, you know, Captain retaking charge moment and a cool standoff and really i mean jumping ahead a little bit it's a really cool lightsaber duel Mm -hmm. that is kind of missing in the first bunch of episodes and really really just a whole very affecting sequence with vader and reva i don't know if we want to jump exactly to that part sure sure yeah i mean we i mean anyone at this point knows we're going to be into spoilers i don't even think there needs to be a warning and if you're mad that we're spoiling obi-wan kenobi episode five four days or so after the episode airs then why the hell are you listening to this podcast you saw that we were talking about obi-wan kenobi and ms marvel there are spoilers ahead so we can dive into i mean i think the biggest spoiler is like just even knowing that they're flashbacking to young anakin and obi-wan because that was I think the biggest reaction point was just that first shot of Coruscant. And you're like, oh, wait a minute. What are we? Oh, look, there's. And for me, as as I was saying, the fact that they flashed all the way back to Attack of the Clones, you know, and gave us a little kind of Obi-Wan Anakin lesson that we never really got to see in Attack of the Clones because they were already like patrolling and stuff like that. You never really got to see Obi-Wan the teacher and Anakin the Padawan. So that was kind of neat. That was kind of neat. And then and then it did. 
I like how it tied into like the themes of that episode, right? Like Anakin's kind of need to always come out on top and Obi-Wan's need to protect others, right? Like his, yeah. his mercy is his downfall and Anakin's ambition is his. And that kind of plays out in the process of the episode. Yeah. And then the thing that Dominic you're hinting at is Reva's turn. And if anything, as, as cool as the Reva Vader fight was, still not 100% convinced I'm jiving with that turn of events because we we had been predicting from the first episode that Reva was the little Padawan at the beginning. Yeah. And we got that content warning for this episode, ironically, right? We didn't get the content right. warning for episode one when it was so close to Uvalde. And now, now I felt like the visuals of this was not even as upsetting as the visuals of the first episode, but you know, we got the content warning. Yeah. And, it, and it confirms Reva was that girl from, from the opening scene. Yeah. And that her whole plan for the entire show was she was trying to get close to Vader to kill him. And that's the thing that I don't quite understand. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I, like, I don't know how much that plan works just narratively. Yeah, I think it's a little outrageous, but cool. <laughs> I mean, deep, deep undercover is what we're talking. Like when a lecture goes deep undercover in the hand and kills a thousand people so she can secretly take them down for shield. That's not a perfect analogy, but I'm just saying sometimes you go all the way bad. Right. Well, because that's the thing where I, where I was a little lost the is that, yes, clearly she has a hatred for Anakin because he slaughtered all of her friends. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't explain her hatred for Obi-Wan. Like I don't get, and her hatred for Jedi in general. Like I, I, I thought it was you know, she hates the Jedi for abandoning them, which makes sense. Mm-hmm. But I, I mean, and I get she hates Vader, but I don't know, like all the work that Third Sister has been doing in the intervening years. I mean, she was pretty close to Vader at multiple points. Like, why did it take Obi-Wan to tell her, hey, why don't you let me go and you get your chance to kill Vader when she's been trying to get Obi-Wan this whole time? Brittany, help me understand Reva's Yeah, how'd you plot. read these things? Yeah, I not 100 percent sure on that to be honest i don't know if it's they're making us think that she's on obi-wan's side and she's really not and they have to theatrically play it out or something and make him feel like that's what's going on Mm. um just so that he they can even get closer to him so i don't know if that's what the actual play is gonna be or they just didn't really think it through and (laughs) you know thought it'd be cooler if oh what if she's actually a after Vader this whole time and not yeah. Obi-Wan like I don't I don't know what the thought process is yeah. there um led to a cool well fight, it doesn't it's but... also I I mean depending on how you read those that key dialogue scene between Obi-Wan and Reva like you know it's not like she's has to choose a side between those two guys she can hate them I both. read it I read it as she was so upset by this terrible experience of being a youngling during the during the massacre that she got just sort of nihilistic and would have beefs or just mistrust for all the adult Jedi. Well, and I wonder, now that you say that, I wonder if there's a part that maybe wasn't quite spelled out in the execution of the episode, but maybe there's a something to be said about like what Obi-Wan kind of almost unlocks that memory for Reva. You know, because Brittany, you know more about Inquisitor lore all of the Inquisitors are basically ex-Jedi. Ex-Jedi are very Force-sensitive people. Right. So, like, you know, the Grand Inquisitor was a guard at the Jedi Temple before Mm -hmm. he became the Grand Inquisitor. So they have all have some connection to the Jedi. So Reva's not unique in that. And, of course, they all become Inquisitors post-Order 66, so they know (laughs) that, like, the Sith are responsible for kind of murdering the Jedi, which they used to be a part of. So anyway, that, that being said, perhaps you know in her in her indoctrination into inquisitorium they wipe some of those memories or they they repress those memories or you know or they use those memories to fuel your hatred to get you closer to the dark side and what obi-wan kind of does is not necessarily bring her to the light but like kind of unlocks not just the hatred that she feels for jedi in general but like specifically for annie i don't know i'm kind of making this up as i go along you know what i mean but like Mm -hmm. i feel like it's that conversation that they have through the wall Mm -hmm. that gets her to start 
considering i guess like she's always had this kind of hatred for anakin i don't know i'm, I'm like well, I said, I'm yeah and also because we're so used to think of star wars in this dark light binary and we get trapped in that because it's not really like that in real right life. there's could be one person who is just like rage lightsabering people this does not necessarily like i'm religious about the dark side <laughs> or religious about the light side that's a di- that's a different you know yeah. type could be which is which is i think where the sequel trilogy was going until it doubled back and we've talked about it several times on the podcast how last jedi sets up this idea that perhaps we have dark and light in within all of us and that's uh-huh. true the true balance of the force it, it just makes me think too that and this kind of goes back a couple episodes when obi-wan brings up having a family and perhaps having a brother uh-huh. and Brittany, i think you mentioned the parallels to ray in episode one where like they're sitting they're using the like heat up food thing and sitting on their yeah. you know sandy planet watching things as they eat their lunch after some menial tasks and it does kind of make you think ray should have been a kenobi yes. <laughs> all along yes. like, he always should have been it if not yes. obi-wan's daughter maybe obi-wan's brother's mm. ki- like obi-wan's niece or something you know what i'm saying like it yeah. just perfectly sets up ray as a kenobi Mm-hmm. But anyway, I mean, that's a, that's just a fleeting thought that, you know, you brought up the light, light in the dark, which was the theme of the sequels. And it just got me thinking that Ray, why was Ray a Palpatine and not a Kenobi? Yeah, no, I've always thought that she should have been a Kenobi, um, especially just like, you know, the person who reaches out to her when she grabs the lightsaber is Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan. Yeah. yeah. And he says, Ray, these are your first steps. <laughs> so it's like, you know, and then I think Ewan said he knew he was going to be doing a show or a movie since he did that dialogue. Mm-hmm. So it was just like that was so long ago. Like how long have they been mapping and planning out the concept of this show slash you know movie? Which yeah. again, I think it shows like there's always there's this you know kind of strike against the sequels as it was not it was poorly planned or not planned, and you know it was this tug of war between JJ and Ryan. And I never believe that because, you know, we've, we've done m- multiple episodes about the Duel of Fate script. Like there was clearly a plan from episodes seven through nine. I think that the two things that really threw a wrench into their plans was mm-hmm. Carrie Fisher passing away. Yes. And then the backlash to episode eight, like the, the, the you know, overwrought backra- backlash to episode eight. Mm-hmm. Because episode nine truly was a reaction. It was a reactionary movie kind of like taking all of the wrong lessons learned from the backlash and then trying to appeal to everyone we're going to appeal to the Raylo shippers and the Raylo haters simultaneously we're going to try to appeal to both and piss off everybody you know and, and then we're going to appeal to the Kelly Marie Tran haters and and sideline her in this movie and then we're going to do we're going to bring back Pal- like all these things that I think kind of goes to show that had they just taken their time and you know I mean, I'm, of course, the biggest thing is is Carrie's death, but I'm sure there was some way to work around that had yeah. they been given the the time and the space to do it. But anyway, we're not going to litigate the sequel trilogy again. But it just got me on a tangent when you mentioned the light and the dark, Dominic. I'm sorry. Well, no, that's the controlling theme. But yeah, the, but also that none of what happens in episode nine is something we even have to account for. We just, <laughs> just don't have to deal with that. We're dealing with this text. Yeah, which exactly, is, exactly. Which is Kenobi for Better Force. I keep calling it Kenobi. It wasn't one at one point just called Kenobi. Yeah, I actually preferred and, it if it was just Kenobi. I think Obi Wan yeah. Kenobi is such a long. It's a long title for Kenobi. Yeah, sounds too. cool, and especially because he's he's Ben in yeah. the show. He's not Obi Wan, but and it's 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 SEO enough. You know, search yeah. engine <laughs> optimized enough as Kenobi. It's like that. Kenobi is one thing. Yeah. So like that would be uh, cool. Like, but anyway, that's a small yeah. point. So. Do you think the Sith should know better than to stab someone through the stomach with a lightsaber? Because that clearly doesn't kill people. <laughs> as as we see when Rupert Friend's Grand Inquisitor yeah. makes his return. Revenge has a will. What does it say? Revenge <laughs> is a good source of, I don't know, yeah. will to live, something like that. But then they leave her. You know, They do the same move. Vader stabs her in the gut and she survives. It also makes you think, like, how did how did Darth Maul stab Qui Gon and kill him when he did? Like, why why are why are Sith stomachs more? Why are they stronger against lightsabers? Because than, than hatred Jedi? is hatred is powerful. 
And maybe Qui-Gon finally realized that he messed up. It was like, oh no, Anakin is not the chosen one. It was like, I'm going to dip before it gets crazy. <laughs> I'll miss all this nonsense. <laughs> so I have a question about Qui-Gon. So clearly episode three sets up, episode three at Revenge of the Sith, I mean, sets mm-hmm. up the fact that Qui-Gon is the first Jedi ever to learn how to become a force ghost. Yeah. Right? Because Yoda is like, I have a secret for you, Ben. Mm-hmm. Well, he doesn't call him Ben, he calls him Obi-Wan. And, and, you know, they've been subtly hinting, not so subtly hinting that Qui-Gon's going to make his return as a ghost because, like, mm-hmm. Chekhov's force ghost. Obi-Wan is reaching out to him in every episode. And then the finale next week, I'm 99% sure Liam Neeson is showing up. Yeah. But my question is, speaking of Qui-Gon's death in Phantom Menace, I remember thinking 20 some odd years ago, oh, he doesn't disappear, right? Like from what we had seen when yoda dies he disappears when uh-huh. obi-wan dies he disappears later we see luke disappearing when he dies but qui-gon doesn't die like you know obi-wan holds him in his arms they they burn him to death or they don't burn yeah. him but they burn his body on naboo uh-huh. and so i guess i'm wondering like <laughs> how did he become a force <laughs> like he's his physical remains don't evaporate like like a force like a proper force ghost is supposed to do i, I guess we'll learn that maybe i don't know is I there anything in the an, lore Brittany? the ashes I, evaporate but go on <laughs> i think there's an episode in clone wars where um yoda kind of goes to where qui-gon got that training or kind of figured out how to do it so i don't know if it was like it's a place where the force is very sensitive so i don't know if like a whole bunch of like force users kind of like it's like they're heaven and they're just kind of there amongst the whatever and Mm -hmm. they were able to somehow Qui-Gon was able to like you know Mm -hmm. come to ghost that they don't fully explain that I don't know if I remember correctly but there is an episode with Yoda and he's like and there's like the three spirits right right that's true the Dave Filoni stuff really does dive more into like the theological aspects of the force right because there are the what is it? The father and the sister and the yeah, brother. Yeah, they 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 show up in, later on, and I think also Qui Gon's voice is on that episode too. And then in Rebels, there's a whole thing about like there's a space outside of space that world that's how Ahsoka, world. the world between worlds, that's how Ahsoka actually survives because yeah. I think she was going to die in her duel with Vader, and then Ezra pulls her out. Yes, and my theory is that's where Ben Solo is. Oh. Yeah. that's interesting why yeah. is that what 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 hints at ben solo being in this because like, people keep like because i feel like adam wants to kind of still play kylo and there's a lot of people who obviously want him to come back so it's just like he's got to be in the world between worlds well for what it's worth the taika waititi movies which i, th- I think are the ones that are closest to being in production Mm-hmm. Are are he's confirmed that they're going to be set post episode nine. So, yeah, but they're going to deal with completely different characters in the Star Wars universe. Yeah. Too, so, so it might he might not be in those, mm-hmm. but I feel like there's a chance we'll see him again. Yeah, he'll definitely need some Force ghosts in those. So, so what is it? What are what are you? Where's the over under and uh, Qui Gon Jinn showing up at some point in episode? Well, definitely. Six. So definitely. <laughs> yeah, dude. It's, it's, that's part of the thing and Obi-Wan still needs like that extra you know mm-hmm. consults an extra friendly kick in the ass to get through this last this last hurdle so speaking of the finale next week there are a couple intriguing things that are being set up that again you know not to presuppose which which I think a lot of Star Wars fans got in trouble doing in the earlier episodes of the series because they were like freaking out over the Grand Inquisitor's death or freaking out over Reva knowing Anakin and all these things where like if you just give it a second they'll explain why you know that's what watching a story is supposed to do Uh but let's let's kind of do that and and speculate a little bit because as we know the the cliffhanger for this episode is again Reva survives the lightsaber to the gut Uh picks up the communicator that Camille Nanjiani's character conveniently dropped that had a message from Bail Organa. Uh, it's oh, broken. Is that what it was? I did not want to know what that doohickey was. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, he, he drops it and that's what she picks okay. up at the end. And she gets like fragments of the Bail Organa message, but she knows enough oh. that there's a boy and Owen, who she met, remember, in the beginning of the mm-hmm. series, and Tatooine. So all arrows point to the finale being on Tatooine, which I'm a little disappointed in because one, I don't want Vader on Tatooine. I feel like yeah, 
I hope that there's no Obi Wan versus Vader on Tatooine. I hope that doesn't happen. But because re- it would be such a shock to the continuity we understand. Yeah, or, it's just a, right because like reason. Vader has no like one of the one of the like the Clark Kent's glasses things about Star Wars forever has been how could Anakin not know he has a son when there's a kid on Tatooine where he's from where his oh, family's right, right. from yeah yeah that would be yeah. named Luke yeah. that, with that his last be, name that would, that would be super weird that has a, that's right that 19 at 19 when he you know Padme died 19 years ago hmm, you know oh. and he's around Leia all the time and can't sense that Leia's his kid he doesn't know Leia is his kid until Return of the Jedi right like he, the first time Vader learns about Le- Leia is sister, you have a sister, right? And that's so Vader is completely clueless about having children, right? That's right. So let's not have that. So, right. So, that's but, but Vader thing. being on that back on like because they have always kind of hand waved Vader not going to Tatooine as you know, he, he hates Tatooine, he would never go back to Tatooine. Okay. So, I hope he doesn't show up on Tatooine. That's one, two, clearly Luke is being unless it's a red herring. Mm-hmm is reva going after luke in the fun in the finale and then there's going to be some sort of like fight over luke maybe you know so i don't know where where, where are you thinking this uh because we need to have one more vader obi-wan confrontation i would assume oh yeah there's definitely one more obi-wan vader confrontation i just don't know how it's gonna play out honestly i don't want to i don't want to over assume and then just be <laughs> disappointed right that's where i'm at with it yeah so yeah, I don't know. Don't really want Luke to show up again as the big surprise in another Star Wars series. I think <laughs> I think that card they played mm-hmm. and played perfectly well in the Mandalorian. But yeah, it's all uh I agree they shouldn't I mean they set it up so obviously they have to, you know, touch base with them somehow, but it's it's again too much crammed into one segment mm-hmm. and too again too much about like oh the reveal as opposed to dealing with the threads that we've established so far. Obviously, we have to make reference to Luke somehow, but let's not like have it uh, all back at the old homestead. Can we circle back to that confrontation sequence between yes. uh, Riva and uh, Vader again, which I found was, again, the most uh, both like cinematically satisfying and most like emotionally affecting part of this episode, and arguably for me, this, this whole series. Because like, if you did say a good thing, about uh yes she survives the attack but uh, for one thing i'm just saying that that's just like a trope of science fiction movies <laughs> the bad guy always lets the good guy or his opponent go when he has a perfect chance to kill him right. that's just something that always happens in science fiction movies sure. oh i've got you in my sights uh says the klingon and then decides for some reason not to fire on the enterprise <laughs> uh river herself weirdly lets Jedi hustler guy go. <laughs> there was, there was in the, the first episode. Yeah, yeah, the Camille character, right? Right, right. The Camille's character, and like that, that was a weird moment. We just like I thought that was the moment when she just sort of lightsabers that guy. But anyway, just to say that's a recurring trope that sure. is silly. But the bad guy always lets the good guy go when they have the perfect chance to kill him. But the fight was really cool because you know how like there's always in Star Wars there's this like sort of uncertainty of like when you use the force and when you use the lightsaber and like this was like a nice you know multifaceted attack scheme that vader is doing here and you know it's got all the it's got lightsabers flying back and forth and it's like whoops I, you've got it now i've got it again i mean cool. and then it shows cool like dance. i think and the character of anakin right or the character of vader where right? he's like i don't even respect you enough to use my own lightsaber right yes. he yeah. keeps his lightsaber hilt to the entire time right so the power dynamic is like coming across right when he when he breaks her double bladed in half it's like throws it at her like yeah all right come on let's go and then and then he's like and then he doesn't even want to again like i said i don't even respect you enough to use my own lightsaber yeah so it's mean i right. mean it's getting that darth vader is really really a mean dude across, <laughs> especially partially stabbing her through the chest and then and then it's really i mean freaking you know i'm not the biggest fan of all these flash flashbacks but that fucking thing with the like if those what she's seeing like the little kids and like mm-hmm. remembering this other trauma as like the last thoughts before ice that is really viscerally affecting for a thousand different reasons and like oh are you freaking gonna die now well i mean hey yes point taken 
Vader really is a villain. Vader really is a bad guy. So it was sort of a mercy that she survived for story reasons because it's mm-hmm. sort of wrenching if she just uh, gets killed like that, uh, especially after the revelations of what she's really going after. Um, and anyway, real quick so- about that flashback, you were like how it cuts back and forth. And, you know, I, I was slightly confused. Does he stab her in the past as well? Or does he, you know, because it looks like when when he stabs her in the present, she cut it cuts back to her as a child and it looks like Anakin is stabbing maybe baby he thought, Maybe he thought he did, but he kind of just like only got her side. Mm. And it, it was, but he was so consumed with like, you know, moving forward that he didn't, you know. Like go back check. and check. Because she says like, I pretended to, to, I pretended I was dead and laid yeah. next to all the other dead young but but clearly he remembers her as a youngling because he even says to her like you thought i didn't know youngling and, and then that's when he when he's having his yeah. battle with her too so yeah there's still some reva vader stuff which like on the surface i'm kind of like yeah but then like the more i think about it it's a little like okay. wait how does that work you know but there's well, another it, episode for it to yeah clear up I mean, not to get too heavy on this, but it, again, there's content warning based on recent events. Mm. And one thing with those recent events, I always think is, uh, you know, we talk about lives lost, but it's the survivors who are going to have their mental state fucked up for the rest of their lives, potentially. I mean, not like people don't survive and like heal from things, oh. but that is like, so when you talk about like whether like, you know, he grazed her with the lightsaber at the moment back in the old days. It doesn't matter. She saw that thing and she's a survivor of it. And she's a kid. Mm-hmm. The sheer weight of that. I don't know. There's, there's just something r- very real about how that could drive you on a completely odd path towards revenge. You know, we, I mean, I, I'm just saying we don't think we don't need to think about it in like rational terms of, oh, right, how, right. how would I assassinate the other? You know, she, <laughs> she's a survivor of like a mass murder at a school. Yeah, she absolutely. Might have, she might have gone on all kinds of different mental trips. Mm-hmm. So maybe her plan is not the one that, you know, you and I think of like is, oh, this would be the <laughs> efficient plan for getting, the, <laughs> you know, it's informed by all kinds of things. Yeah, and that's for point. some reason, that's the thing that really hit me, you know, in full context of things. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, I'm just making my defense for that. No, 100%. And I'm I'm not trying to be like a nitpick or anything. I, like I said, the, you know, there's just some of the some of the Reva Vader things just from a narrative, from a plot perspective. But as we've said multiple times on this podcast, like plot isn't the only thing, right? It's like a good story is much emotion as it is plot. And if, if you're able to kind yeah. of convey the emotion in a particular scene, even if the plot that you know and this is why like the internet has been such a force for evil when it comes to like analyzing any kind of story because like that that whole cinema sins like plot hole mm-hmm. kind of stuff people are just more concerned about like finding plot holes than being absorbed in the emotion of the story so yeah please that is not what i'm saying at all and i think you're absolutely right dominic that the emotion of that scene works 120 percent. yeah and people get their emotions you know activated by different things you know that's that's why we, <laughs> yeah that's why we can't all have nice things because we don't quite agree but that's fine <laughs> for for me that part super worked even though i was confused by this series in general <laughs> oh, that's what I'm saying. all right so we're gonna we're gonna end the conversation on obi-wan there we have one more episode the finale next week we're gonna take a break and after the break we're gonna come back and chat about ms marvel episode two we have another sponsor for the podcast y'all we do do you have an idea for a great new podcast you can bring your idea to life and start your podcast today with libsyn our podcast has been on libsyn for as long as this has been a podcast and we love using the service Brittany, you guys over the dc tv podcast are also loyal libsynites yes Yes, we are nate and andy usually deal with all the back end of that (laughs) but we do use libsyn and from what they say it's great and amazing so Yes. Well, let me tell you about it. Libsyn has everything you need to plan, launch, and grow your own podcast. It provides some of the best resources created by expert podcasters who will show you everything you need to know, like what equipment to use, how to record audio, how to get your show on Apple Podcasts and other platforms, and much, much more. Plus, as a friend of the Hard Knock Life, when you sign up with Libsyn, you get your first month of podcast hosting for free. There's never been a better time than right now for you to start podcasting. Visit Libsyn.com 
Use the code FRIEND, that's F-R-I-E-N-D, and that's Libsyn, L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. Use the code FRIEND, F-R-I-E-N-D, to get started and create your podcast today, friends of the pod. Yeah, and you know, like on that, like a lot of people ask, how do you do a podcast? Like people don't do any media stuff before, and they say, well, it's not a tremendous amount of work, but there is one little piece, chunk of technical work that you got to do, but Libsyn makes it pretty easy, (laughs) I'd say. That's right. And if you sign up with the code FRIEND, F-R-I-E-N-D, at Libsyn.com, L-I-B-S-Y-N.com, you'll get your first month hosting a podcast for free. That's a big deal. Yes. The code FRIEND at Libsyn.com. Guess what? Goalie Nutrition is sponsoring Hard Knock Life, and you can go to Goalie.com to buy apple cider vinegar gummies. They're ashwagandha gummies, super fruit gummies, and super greens gummies. And you get 10% off plus free shipping if you use the code HARDKNOCK at Goalie.com. This is honestly, I've been taking the Goalie gummies now for for a couple weeks. And I have to say, they're tasty and they're good for you. Have you guys been enjoying the Goalie gummies? I really like them. They're yummy. But it's a nice to add to my like routine of already like, I normally take just straight vitamin C. So it's nice to have like extra supplements. For a long time, people have, have... praise the benefits of apple cider vinegar and you know as someone who's had to like drink straight apple cider vinegar sometimes when i'm not (laughs) feeling well or you know i have a some joint pain and your mom is like drink some apple cider vinegar it's Mm. not the most appetizing home remedy let's just say right it tastes horrible like the apple cider part is like ooh, does it taste like apple cider it is like no it tastes like vinegar but acv is very good for you and the fact that goalie has been able to put the acv into these tasty little gummies made with pectin and fruit peels, which make them vegan, which is cool. So if you're vegan, you can still rock these gummies because everyone knows gummies are usually made out of like gelatin and nasty shit. And this, these are made out of complete non-GMO, gelatin-free, gluten-free, vegan ingredients. And you can get the benefits, all of the benefits of apple cider vinegar taking these tasty, delicious, convenient gummies. So go to goalie.com. And use the code HARDNOCK, that's H-A-R-D-N-O-C, just like the podcast you're listening to. Get 10% off your purchase of Goalie products and free shipping. It's a much better delivery device for that apple cider vinegar. Yeah. You, these Goalie gummies are great. You get I it and it's, it's a delicious little candy. And I, I've been enjoying the Superfruits one. I did feel kind of refreshed after taking a few of those. Yeah, no, but I'm loving them so far. And they're definitely tasty. If you just want tasty gummies, at least just <laughs> eat them for the, the, like, the yummiest. Yeah. yeah. So go to Goalie.com, use the code HARDNOCK, H-A-R-D-N-O-C, get 10% off your purchase and free shipping at Goalie.com with the code HARDNOCK. Hard Knock Life is being sponsored by Athletic Greens. I want to talk to you about Athletic Greens. With one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging. Basically all the things. One of the best things about Athletic Greens is that it's lifestyle friendly, whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free. It also contains less than one gram of sugar and no GMOs, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything, and it still tastes good. Athletic Greens uses the best of the best products based on the latest science with constant product iterations and third-party testing. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills or supplements to look out for your health. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is partnering with Hard Knock Media to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash emerging. That's athleticgreens.com slash emerging to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Ms. Marvel, y'all. I am utterly yeah. delighted constantly by this, by this show. Still hard, delightful. <laughs> Hard, were you yes. su- were you surprised her mom was open to her going to a party so soon after sneaking out for AvengerCon though? Like I was a little like I thought she was grounded, mom. <laughs> a little bit, but then I don't know if she's just trying to like you know actually form a decent relationship with her daughter that she's like okay, 
maybe I should allow her to have some sort of fun. I don't know what the exact thought process there was, but I thought it was off too. I was like, interesting. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, because, you know, that's how moms do sometimes. I mean, like, it's not, she's, it's not about enforcing the punishment. I mean, it's about reminding you that oh, you, you did a bad thing. But as we've seen, you know, her parents really are trying to meet her halfway. Yeah. A lot of things, like with that whole dressing up in Hulk right. bit, which is just like, oh, that's so much like, oh, mom, parents trying to be nerdy. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, if intentions. anything, but, I feel more bad for the mom and dad than kamala in that scene right like yeah. especially dad he's like all painted up and he's like i'm all gonna excited. go to the con with you and right. she's like i hate you dad right yeah. and that's such a true thing it's <laughs> like when he's trying to be into the thing your kids are but like not don't quite exactly get it. right i mean but so just that point yeah she's she's gonna she's gonna say oh you know don't do that but she's just trying to steer her on the right path so yeah she's got to it makes that special relax on certain things. Right, right. Even well, though... And two aspects of this episode that are kind of like default for any teen superhero coming of age origin story is the, you know, unexplained <laughs> irrational confidence at school the next day after discovering your superpowers. Yes, beautiful. And, and the training montage. What do we think of both sequences? I thought it was very funny um, and used very well. Um, I don't know. I just feel like visually... Miss Marvel is probably one of the best shows on Disney Plus. So I just like all the visuals and every of like her scenes. And I really like the part where you think she's gonna like fall off a cliff and she or like the ledge of like the building. <laughs> and she's like, just let me go, Bruno, let me go. And then he does, and it's just like a less step. than an inch. Yeah. <laughs> that was really funny. It's really well done. And I love the the it's a little end gimme, but in like well, yeah, was I was gonna say, way. I think it's it's totally a callback to Black Widow, right? You have to let me go. And <sighs> and it's like 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 Brittany said, it's just it's not even like a five foot drop down to the to the to the floor. But going back to the the irrational confidence when you know we in the setup in the first episode, it's you know, there's the coach that doesn't know her name, and there's the kid who's like you know playing basketball in the hallway for whatever reason there's the two girls by her locker and she's very like in the first episode too shy to like correct the coach or she's too shy to like move the kids and in this one she's like i got superpowers now <laughs> i'm gonna yeah. like tell the coach how to say my name i'm gonna move you guys away from my locker and just be super confident until she sees Comron. Mm-hmm. and there's like the hot new senior and all that confidence evaporates the may song goes away And we have our conflict, which I loved for most of the episode between Bruno, who we didn't talk about last week, but we'll talk about Mm -hmm. this week, who clearly has a thing for Kamala. Yes. And then Kamala, who is now infatuated with Kamran. As the comics experts, guys, can you explain a little bit more about Kamran? Because I know Kamran is a character from the comics and there's a lot of similarities in that they kind of bond over their culture and over their heritage but also at, at what's revealed in the comics is that they're also he's also an inhuman we don't know if he's inhuman or if he's enhanced yet There's, in this show i can't remember because it's been so long since i've read the first like a uh, few comics of it um i don't remember if he's the one who actually ends up being a bad guy mm-hmm. oh no he's a bad guy okay i i couldn't i mean remember. i don't know maybe he goes back the other way in some art but but I remember because he he like indoctrinates her into like the bad guy in human club that yeah and that's what if I remember correctly yeah there's someone who takes her to like the bad guy side of like the Inhumans and I just remember there's like a red her, a yeah, red character red dagger I don't remember Something if he's like red that. dagger oh, God, or not what is he called yeah. But yeah, he is definitely inhuman, and I think he's like turns sort of blue and glows or something. I can't mm-hmm. remember what his power thing is. And he kidnaps her, and there's evil inhumans. And yeah, but in the you know metaphor is like he's that hot guy you shouldn't have had a crush on because really, it's, <laughs> whoa, bad news. Uh, so that's that's cool, and so that'll probably play out that way. Even though you know, I'm pretty sure they're still not going to say the word 
in, in human. human in this <laughs> and it's just because it's the wrong word for this kind of uh, story and also it's it's fine if they just ignore that whole inhuman thing like no one's <laughs> no one's championing that like marvel it's okay you can miss a few like and we just don't talk about that but yeah that was that was that was a cool twist because because hot dude but yeah he's gonna have a secret secret superpowered agenda and it's kind of sad too because like there is a lot of chemistry between the two actors for sure you know i love them bonding in the car over sweatshop boys which is ironic because riz ahmed is one half that's of sweatshop what I, boys that's what i thought yeah 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 and and i mean he's he's i guess tangentially part of the marvel universe because he was in venom but he's definitely in star wars <laughs> but i just love that riz ahmed himself like the, the man the actor exists in the mc riz ahmed exists in the yeah. mcu yeah I, I don't know if the Venom movies exist in the MCU or not, but Riz Ahmed does, and that's cool. Yeah, well, Rogue One does. <laughs> yeah, cl- clearly. All Star Wars As exists. a movie. Yeah, and that's why, you know, teenage love is stupid, because the scenes where they're bonding over stuff is is so great. So, you know, common cultural touch points. And again, like, it's one of those things, like, when you're telling a story about a culture that people don't necessarily know, like, it's it's cool that there's stuff I don't recognize because I recognize the process of them talking about it. Right. Even though it may seem to me like jargon, it's just like watching, you know, the jargon in like one of the Bourne movies, like with, <laughs> like there's all this military stuff that you like, you, that you as a, you as a viewer have to like have, have to get into and, and accept to just understand the world that these characters are in. And of course then it's, but it, it makes it even more sad that, you know, he's, gonna double cross her but that's teenage love is stupid but i do love that everything in this episode in particular like that is kind of like culturally specific is played off as matter of fact yeah and that's what i think is so brilliant about the show is like they're not assuming that like non-muslims or white people are the audience so that they have to spoon feed in fact there's a lovely scene in the diner where she says, my Ami, my mother. And then he says, you don't have to translate. I know what that means, you know? And that's just yeah. kind of like symbolic of the entire show, right? Like where they where they casually show Nakia and Kamala going to the mosque and washing themselves and doing prayer without having to like linger on it to make it seem exotic. It's just kind of a natural thing that this is what we do. That Eid Mubarak is just a thing that we do. And, and then I love how like there's all the different clicks at the festival at the mosque right there's the mosque bros and then the the ig kids and it's like you know greg pock used to always say the more specific you make a thing the more universal it is and that, like there's something for everyone to recognize even if they're yeah. very specific to the, the to the culture i, I did want to yeah. flash right back to the common kamala thing where <laughs> i don't know if you picked up on it when they're talking about their love of bollywood movies and their mother's obsession with one of the actors you did you pick up on who they were talking about yes kingo yeah (laughs) kingo from the eternals we actually get an eternals reference yeah this which was which was really neat because i feel like eternals is the redheaded stepchild of the mc right now no one references eternals right but he was in all those movies right because that was the whole shtick of kumail's character is that like he's playing you know because he's an immortal eternal he's just pretending to be the descendant of himself it yeah. just happens to look alike over generations. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was neat. And again, back to what you said, Keith, like about the sort of matter of fact way that they're introduced to the world, not necessarily spoon fed. I really like that part. And also I really like how, you know, like there is uh, you know, it's unusual to have a Muslim superhero, but they're not to say like they don't paint it like, you know, Islam is the best thing ever or the worst thing ever it is just part of their lives mm-hmm. and you know they go to this mosque and that's part of, of their life but the mosque has you know it's gender discrimination issues and they get to get into that too and that's that's like a great uh it's like a great dynamic going on there without it being the whole thing right because yeah. like i love you know because typically if you know i'm thinking of like a show like homeland or whatever like where there is like a muslim presence but it's all about how you know uh sexist islam is you know what mm-hmm. i mean and i don't think they I don't think they highlight that, you know, because for every complaint that Nakia has, she still talks about her devoutness and that she wears the hijab, not by, you know, anything other than the fact that she it makes her feel like who she is. Right. Because there's the mm-hmm. assumption that women who cover themselves are doing so because they're forced because of the gender discrimination. And yeah. so it's, it is a great balance of both. Right. Mm-hmm. What do you think of Nakia? Because this is the first time we got to see her. She's like shows up a little bit in the first episode, but this is very much a she's Nakia focused. She's 
close to her comic book counterpart, but a little bit different. Um, I feel like that's more of a conversation of a Suara. Um, <laughs> well, I know how Suara feels about yes, the actors. I know. Um, so yeah, I I feel like I don't want to dive into that yeah. aspect of it just because I feel like that's not the right person to talk about that. But she is a little bit different than uh, or at least racially, she's a little slightly different than what her actual race is in the comics and things like that. But she still feels like Nakia who's, you know, wanting to lead change and do things. And, you know, that's how she is in the comics. She's very like- uh, Yeah, she's definitely like the the, the social justice. She's a social justice friend and she's very much that in the show still. So at least that's there. And just the for the thing- purposes of the show, she does say the thing that, like, I felt too white for this world. And yeah, she's mixed. For this world. And she's not mixed real- in the comics. Yeah, she's not mixed in the Right. Comics. So, but, uh, but like, it, at least they're addressing right. what she which actually I- is in this show, which yeah. is, yes. which is mixed. And that's, that's very, you know, that's a super Asian American experience. And I think it's uh, still very resonant. I, I think, like, I, I was still, even if I wasn't, uh, hundred percent familiar with the comics like i i don't i think it's better than if they had just cast a straight up white girl to play nakia right like mm-hmm. they they found a mixed actress and rather than you know portraying her as something else in this which has been controversial even from the beginning because there are uh people who are upset that the parents aren't played by pakistani actors but indian actors and which is a whole thing too because it, they talk about it in this episode which is kind of kind of great actually that there's a whole conversation around partition that you don't see a lot in Western media mm-hmm. having such an honest discussion about partition and, and you know what that meant for so many generations of Pakistani and Bengali and Indian people. And and the I think mom says it best, like the British left us a mess. And that's kind of like mm-hmm. the 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 short and sweet of it all. But yeah, I think you know, I, I mm-hmm. give them credit at least that they cast a mixed actor, so they brought some of that into her character the only thing that i was a little bumped up against is i and again it's been a while since i've read the Ms. marvel comics but i thought you know what you were saying about nikki in the comics is she's very much a social justice i feel like she's also very like marxist right isn't she kind of like anti late stage capitalism in the comics too i think so because but then in the in the show she's well, that's like really the word you can't say in these shows well that was about to say in the, in the show she's a little like she's very like fashion forward and she's like my versace shoes are gone i'm like would nakia be rocking some versace shoes i feel like nakia of all people but anyway that's that's just kind of like yeah they're they're yeah, yeah. they can be all <laughs> kinds of races they're not gonna let the kids talk about socialism on, <laughs> on the, you know on, on the disney on show the mass yeah. market superhero show i just bumped i just yeah. was like wouldn't akia wear versace is all that. but I, I could be wrong i don't know if she's like fashion forward in the in the comics or not i can't remember but right so anyway, so but back to like things they're slightly modifying from the comic stories that we know and love. Um, like, you know, it's we talked a lot about the powers issue. You now the you know, the polymorphic powers or this mm-hmm. great, you know, metaphor for body dysmorphia in young people. And now maybe are we losing that part aspect or not? Well, I mean they're still totally doing it. Like mm-hmm. I like that she gets like basically a cosmic zit in the middle <laughs> of class, which is totally awkward. Yeah. And totally does, the, you know, totally does that whole uh, you know, teenage body awkwardness things. Um and uh and I mean it I, goes it goes back to what I said a couple of weeks ago that like I don't all the things that they've changed or modified or adjusted for live action. Mm-hmm. This is true for any adaptation, as long as they don't lose the essence mm-hmm. of the original. Because I think where things get messed up in adaptation is if when you adapt something and then you essentially you're just using the IP, but then the story you're telling has nothing to do with the original IP. You know what I mean? And it's just like, mm-hmm. why not just tell an original story? Why are you using like, you know, without throwing shade? It's like the Gotham Knights show that's coming. <laughs> it's like, why are you even using the Batman IP if this show has literally nothing to do with Batman? But you're just using that as the hook to get audiences in. That I think is insulting. But, you know, as someone who used to watch Smallville and defend it against people like, this isn't a Superman. No, the essence of those characters are still there. I feel like that's more so here in Ms. Marvel. Like, 
there, everything that you're seeing is is 100 recognizable from the comics even if it's modified slightly to to match a character an actress's ethnicity mm -hmm. or a character's you know something that just would work better in live action than it does on a page you know what i mean i think mm -hmm. but the essence as dominic is saying the kind of like awkward teenage body issue polymorphic powers or not are still there yeah they're just riffing on that in a jazz kind of way they're doing the exact same device but they're getting a, a similar idea across um like i was thinking of um you know back to they've uh modified the origin of the powers will just probably have something to do with this bangle from her grandma mm -hmm. Aisha back in the day it has to do with this important story of of partition getting out of there and um, that again is a better device for telling this story than alien alien gas arrives <laughs> which are the only thing we're sad about losing the humans is lockjaw let's be honest we can lose all the humans <laughs> yeah. the sad thing is that she's not gonna have the big magic teleporting dog i mean and the way that we know him from the humans maybe he shows up but sorry tangent um <laughs> so that's a much better device for getting this story uh with the this magical bracelet and i well, i was thinking of like that green lantern story with uh, with the vietnamese kid mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know uh that we that we covered a little while ago yeah. you know how how they uh rejiggered the story the traditional green lantern myth and that one to be I think it was like, you know, a piece of jewelry. His mom's and, jade or his grandmother's his jade ring or something was really yeah. a Green Lantern. Which for, fits perfectly in the essence, yeah. has the right color and vibe, um, but it's just like a modified uh, version of the story. So um, mm -hmm. I think that works. I don't know. I just, I just think that's working beautifully. Yeah. Well, final thing to say about Ms. Marvel and the, the big reveal at the end is that so real quick, Ms. Marvel finally uses her powers to save someone, some stupid kid who was like taking selfies outside of a window and he f falls over. Yeah. Uh, but she finally uses her powers to save him, quote unquote. It doesn't go great. But then the mm. Department of Damage Control shows up mm -hmm. and she's rescued by Kamran. And we were talking about earlier in the comics, Kamran is, I think he works for some evil inhuman, which whose name we don't remember. Mm -hmm. The big change for the show so far, we don't know. 100% what's going on but it seems yeah. to be instead of the big red face demon that he works for in the comics he is the son of ostensibly Kamala's great grandmother because we, we see a vision of her when she puts on the bracelet or when yeah. the dad is talking about partition in the dining room and that's the first time we see a vision of her and then she's in the back seat of the of the Porsche yeah so I'm not exactly sure where they're going with that but she's clearly like the evil like what are you asking no, like, <laughs> i'm just saying that that's that's the like that's the big difference from the comics is that Kamran is more tied to her family apparently mm -hmm. and not just like the evil inhuman who's recruiting her to the bad side yeah there's a little bit more connection with, which i'm assuming that's her great grandmother that she's asking the illuminantes about <laughs> you know because we see mm -hmm. a vision of her and everyone's scared of her but then she's look, looking youthful in the back of the in the back of the Porsche. So what what do you think where do you think the story is going there based on your prior knowledge of the show, uh, prior knowledge of the comics and where they're how they're adapting for the show? I don't know, maybe they are setting her up to be a big bad but she's really not and maybe it's going to be damaged control. So, we I don't, don't know. know who the big bad is in yet, yeah. the show, so. On that like some people have been, you know, remarking that there isn't uh, big bad there's not all there's also not a big like typical fight action sequence so far and you know that's out of out of the formula for marvel shows but i think it's real cool here and again i'm just going to go back to the ways that uh kamala khan uh echoes peter parker like uh and, you know as i like to say when anyone who listens like the one of the great things about spider-man is that his powers are more like for a public safety officer than <laughs> for like you know beat him up superhero you know i mean he literally like creates safety nets and like rescue lines that's most of what he does so mm -hmm. sorry this is a long-winded way of getting towards it's cool that her first couple events are just using her powers to help someone out to mm -hmm. create a soft landing she doesn't have to start like bashing people immediately mm -hmm. like powers can be 
for something besides getting into fight with other people with powers. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's saving and, using using superpowers to save people rather than like punch bad guys. Yeah, and that's fine. In this which, context, it's really fine. Which is like the the Superman problem, right? Like we in the in the modern era of Superman movies, we actually never see Superman saving people, but we'll see him like punch the shit out of people. You know what I mean? And that's. The, yeah, we well, concentrate on the brute force aspect of stars, but at, at one point it was really like, oh, someone's falling out of a skyscraper. Right. Wouldn't it be nice if someone could catch them? And yeah, okay, it's a little unrealistic. Not that many people, okay, not that many people have falling uh, skys- off building problems as much as they have in the first two episodes <laughs> of Miss Marvel or giant ant man <laughs> head. But those are unusual, but they're still more realistic than super villains <laughs> like, yeah that you have that, to punch. that shit really happens so right. yeah or we're just saving the saving a kitten from a tree at the right very, yeah right, wouldn't yeah. it be nice to have a, a neighborhood person who had these uh extra magical light powers um which by the way they're they're, they're they are really trolling green lantern with this like making things out of my imagination and she even says like my imagination so yeah it's yeah, yeah. clearly like using some much more and uh and that's fine um so that's that's Ms. Marvel. I, I'm you know, we we're two episodes into that, and I think that's another six episode series. So we still have some time after Obi-Wan wraps up next week to to dive into the continuing adventures of Kamala Khan. I'm I'm I I knew I was gonna like the show. I didn't think I was gonna like it this much. I think yeah, just just like you know, we said last week, we kept using the word delightful, and it's like the only show on television where I'm literally grinning ear to ear from like mm-hmm. the beginning until it's over i'm like i just yeah. can't help smiling while i watch that show so amon Vellani is just she's such a it was just keep overusing the word she's such a delight i just love watching yeah. her presence on screen as kamala khan she's yeah. such the perfect uh, embodiment of that character but anyway that's uh that's ms marvel before we wrap up Brittany monet what is nerd poppin um, I saw Lightyear yesterday, which was a lot of fun. Nice. Um, Chris Evans is great, and I can definitely see why Andy would want to get a Buzz Lightyear toy. And that be <laughs> you went out and bought thing. one, didn't you? <laughs> Maybe no. Uh, <laughs> well, it was fun. I want to say, like, I'm like the confusion, quote unquote, about this movie just irks me to no end. Like, I do not understand why so many people are so up in arms. Like, even Chris Evans' tweet that got dunked on like two years ago about like, this is about the man, not the toy. Like it was obvious from the announcement of this movie. And yet people are still like freaking out. Like, how does this fit into the continuity of Toy Story? Yeah. It's like the only way to explain it for people who maybe are listening to this podcast and still don't understand. It's like, let's say, you know, they released this movie in Andy's universe. He saw it, he liked it. And when they came down to toy launch, the actor was like, I don't want to fucking voice my own toy <laughs> which is like so, usually what it happens so then they, they got like someone who sounds pretty close sorry it's tim allen and he voiced the toy like that's it that is like literally the only like explanation i can give people for them to understand what's like going yeah. on yeah but again that's so obvious like i saw a movie critic tweet and i apologize i forget who said it but they tweeted out like after seeing the movie that there's like a title card at the beginning that explains just that yes and he was like if only disney had said this from the beginning people wouldn't be confused and i was like who's confused (laughs) yeah it's it says in the beginning um you know we knew buzz was a toy of something right (laughs) on the show or like you know we knew that so it's just like why is it so difficult to understand that it's like you know i blame the unified pixar theorists because like if you're not familiar with the unified pixar theory it's essentially every pixar movie that's ever been released all exists within the same universe Mm -hmm. and Lightyear throws a big wrench into it because again it doesn't fit perfectly into the continuity of toy story but it's not supposed to it's i think it's a neat idea it's kind of like like what if we got to see the thing that inspired andy to want the toy that's is like that's so obvious from like the beginning but anyway mm-hmm. i'm glad you enjoyed it it looks like it was, a fun movie yeah it was very fun and i also watched hustle last night which was really good too with adam sandler on netflix mm-hmm. both recommend yeah nice which is about basketball and yes which i, know. I know nothing about so <laughs> there's a part at the end where they show like who played themselves and i was like i didn't know any <laughs> didn't... of these people besides shaquille o'neal and charles <laughs> barkley dominic i know you were watching some basketball over the weekend 
Yeah, Warriors champions of the NBA again. Again, this one was cool because, well, I don't know, because <laughs> your good buddy Steph finally won an MVP. Yeah, my friend Steph Curry. Who I get, I hope he got to sing. You know, so sick uh, <laughs> afterwards. Because um, for those yeah. of you who like don't know what we're talking about. Uh, a couple months ago, Dominic got to interview Steph and Aisha Curry. Yeah, which regarding their cool. HBO show about last night, not regarding basketball. No, and at that time we were just where he had a little injury, and we were mm, we we're wondering how it's <laughs> going to go. But they went all the way. Yeah, um, congratulations. So, other than basketball, what's nerd popping for Dominic Ball? Oh, well, I was going to say, um, I won't say that I watched Blade Trinity, but it was on this weekend. It was on the channel and I watched some of it. And I was just uh, pleasantly reminded of how, you know, in many ways, Blade started a template for modern Marvel movie. Mm -hmm. You know, not all the ways. He doesn't have a mask, mm -hmm. but fighting vampires, some, you know, that's... Is some uh, would, would R rated. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was, I was, I always thought like, oh, it got made because it, it kind of crosses over the vampire killing genre, which is something that people, uh, um, you know, already liked before superhero movies were coming out every other minute. Anyway, <laughs> tangent. Blade did start the yes template for the modern Marvel movie in many important aspects, and then I was just reminded how Blade Trinity, which you know even Blade fans like maybe don't like so much kind of started that template of mass um, crossover of way too many characters at once because, oh God, it has freaking Ryan Reynolds in it as Hannibal King and Jessica Biel and Patton Oswalt. And it's like this whole like team assembling. And, you know, that might, again, might have seemed like a weird idea at the time, uh, but it sure uh, played out and has like, you know, an eventual direct a line or even a web line i'd say to avengers endgame and um uh spider-man way no way home so you know i guess i'm saying you know vampire hunters assemble was like <laughs> was the lesson i learned from that what anyway. channel was it on by the way it just i think it was on tnt because they were showing like every superhero movie uh and um so it was the toned also, down version too so it wasn't like the the since it was on basic cable yes it was on basic cable with commercials and stuff and possibly related to, uh, you know, Juneteenth related programming, you know, if you want to make that connection. Uh, <laughs> oh, the black superhero? <laughs> black, black male lead, you know, I again, there's, there aren't a ton of those uh, yeah, in that's the a stretch. superhero genre. It's a bit of a stretch. Uh, for me, I'm, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm quite excited for the announcement of the Joker sequel, ironically enough. I know that that's a movie that we covered uh, some, for some time a couple years ago and lamented a lot of the coverage of Joker just because all you know as as well as it did as like a billion dollar grossing movie it was Oscar not just nominated but one for Joaquin Phoenix and the original score and yet it does play into the tropes of like a grieved white male who only gets attention through hyper violence and the message you know the wrong message I, I, you could say kind of like gets gets uh um gets the fans riled up right like it's got it's very much in the 4 channy <laughs> you know internet troll uh space so all that said what i love about the announcement of joker 2 subtitled folly adieu is that not only are they in talks to cast Lady Gaga to play Harley Quinn, there is a rumor that it's going to be a musical. And you know, well, first of all, you know how I feel about DC and musicals. I love me some DC musicals. And two, I just love that the, the type of fanboy, and let's be real, they were all boys, who was so stoked for Joker speaking their truth are a little up in arms about the fact that you have Lady Gaga in a musical <laughs> as the sequel to Joker. Mm -hmm. And I love that. <laughs> and that's the kind of chaos we need in the world is all I'm saying. Yeah, I'm pretty excited for that. I, was a, I wasn't I was super into the first movie, um, but this, this announcement made me like, okay, maybe I do want to watch the movie. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't even care if it's like, you know, 
not good. <laughs> I just love the idea. The idea yes. of a Lady Gaga fronted musical sequel to mm -hmm. the Edge Lordy first movie where Joker literally says we live in a society. I hope it's the most chaotic musical ever. <laughs> like I'm just ready for it. Yes, I'm 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 with you, but I don't want it to be too chaotic. Like like I'm don't want to be like the South Park musical, which a lot of people <laughs> love, but I think is also just like a version of like, you know, pro dick jokes and turned into song into sort of a parody of what a musical is. Right. I mean, I, that's that would be my concern. I like Lady Gaga can write a good song, can write a good movie song. So that's fine. So I think that's a fine idea. I hope they embrace the uh, the tragic comedy part of that, like we saw in Birds of Prey rather than the right like, yeah, of the joker that's the absolutely right and that's the different exactly vibe. that and that's kind of what i'm hoping for right like that there's more of that again i just love that all the like dude bros are kind of pissed off about this joker announcement mm -hmm. so that's at the very least just give me more of that just give me more whiny dude bros on the internet mm -hmm. <laughs> with that Brittany Monet. Or let's take taking out of context. That's the thing that will get cut in. <laughs> he says that he's being sarcastic. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Go ahead. Brittany, how can people find you on the internet? Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Hi Brittany Monet, and then you can check out also at Naomi Podcast, which is uh, the Naomi Podcast as well as the backlog of Black Lightning Podcast and the home for the Lituation Room. Dominic Ma. Uh, I'm Dominic Ma, um, Twitter, Instagram, Dama, D-O-M-M-A-H. I am Keith Chow. You can follow me on Twitter at The Real Chow, the underscore real underscore Chow, and follow the Nerds of Color at the Nerds of Color. Go to hardknockmedia.com to find this and all the podcasts in the Hard Knock family. Give us a like and a review if you do. Also, subscribe to our videos at youtube.com slash the Nerds of Color. And support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash the nerds of color. And until next time. To infinity. <laughs> to infinity. To infinity. And pizza ice cream. Is that one of the Fast and Furious movies? No. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about. Like, you